Hello, my name is Melissa Conley-Tyler. I'm a research associate at the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to this seminar on Hong Kong and the national security law one year on. Um, I acknowledge that the Asia Institute is located on the land of the Ngunnawal, uh, sorry, the land of the Wurundjeri people. And uh, that's too much time in Canberra for me. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so we're, we're delighted today to be running a seminar as uh, marking an important anniversary, um, a difficult anniversary uh, for many. Um, and we're welcoming uh, two excellent, um, excellent experts on this area from uh, the Georgetown Law School Centre for Asian Law. So I welcome Thomas E. Kellogg, Professor Thomas E. Kellogg, and Lydia Wong. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, to kick us off, I'm going to ask uh, the Director of the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies, uh, Mao Guan, just to say a little bit more about the Asia Institute and the work we do about the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies and about the Melbourne Asia Review, which is where this research has come from. So over to you, Mark. And we can't hear you yet, Mark. Just press that wonderful unmute button that we all know well. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Wong. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Contemporary Chinese Study, and also the Center for Contemporary Chinese Studies hosting the Asian Institute. And also we have an Asian Review, you know, uh, Melbourne Asian Review. And um, basically, as the name suggests, the Center for Contemporary Chinese Studies study contemporary Chinese issues. Uh, I just, this is the perfect time to talk about the perfect topic of perfect time. Uh, again, you know, everybody knows 24 years ago, July 1st, 1997 uh, was the dramatic uh, historical turning point uh, for Hong Kong and for China. On that day, the whole world attention was on Hong Kong and official transfer of uh, sovereignty over Hong, over Hong Kong. Officially, the city state called something Hong Kong Special Administration Region or PRC. Hong Kong under the one country, two system. After 24 years, 23 years, last year, again, another dramatic event again, about Hong Kong is national security law. And this is the perfect time to talk about these controversial issues. So we have a wonderful speaker today. I'm um, just briefly say Center for Contemporary Chinese Study. We are interested in China contemporary issues and, and we're looking forward for the uh, uh, wonderful talk today, yeah. Oh, thank Lisa. you very much, Mark. No, much appreciated. And uh, it's a pleasure to be working with Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies on this on this webinar. Um, the, I suppose the genesis of this discussion is the article that Thomas and Lydia wrote for the most uh, the most recent edition of the Melbourne Asia Review, which was looking um, at human rights and civil society in Asia uh, and their analysis. We found fascinating, um, very very timely given some of the the thing the um the events this week um, and we asked them if they'd be willing to share their research in this format um, so what we're going to do is Lydia's going to speak first um, as you can see she's got her camera off uh, and then Thomas is going to speak Lydia's going to talk I think a, a bit about some of the most recent developments and then Thomas is going to look more at um, uh, you know the specifically at one case at the Jimmy Lai case um, now just for everyone, we really want a lot of discussion on this. We've left 20 minutes for question and answer at the end, if at all possible, and we really look forward to that. Um, I'll just give very quick road rules that, you know, this obviously is an academic seminar. Um, it's not a political one, it's an academic one. And so um, that means we have certain norms. We're going to, um, you know, be tough on arguments, um, but courteous towards people. And so we're looking forward to a, um, you know, a civil discussion um, of these issues. Um, I'm also conscious it's a really difficult issue for a lot of people. It's got emotional um, valence and we understand that. Um, if you want to contribute to the question and answer anonymously, um, that's, that's something you can do very easily. You just um, put your question into the question, that tick, make this anonymous. So that's your, your choice, how you'd like to go with that. So now over to Lydia with no more ado. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, great. So I will try to share my um, screen. 
um, let me find, <laughs> let me find it first. Um, so um, we know you can do this. It worked. It worked in our test, so it'll it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I find it. Um, okay. well, as you're getting, so, yes. mm -hmm. oh, okay. it's perfect. Because as you, 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 it's been a very, um, very dramatic week, and so you can tell us a bit about what happened in the last week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm actually choosing a little bit uh, a dramatic uh, title of this presentation. Um, but first, I want to say sorry to everyone because um, I'm not using my camera because I'm a Chinese national and um, need to go back to China in the foreseeable future. So uh, for my own security, I'm going to keep my camera off. Um, hope everyone can understand. So today we are going to talk about the national security law in Hong Kong um, and um, particularly about the Jamie Lai case. So there are actually some latest development related to the Jamie Lai case uh, and it's a very striking event, um, which is um, corresponding to this title that I choose how to close the most popular newspaper in seven days. Um, so it also shows the sweeping power of the national security law. In particular, uh, in particular, we are going to talk about this newspaper called Apple Daily, um, which to give um, everyone a little bit of background is the most popular newspaper in Hong Kong. Um, so um, I think the equivalent comparison of it could be like um, New York Times or Washington Post in the US and maybe for some conservative uh, audience like Fox News. So like imagine closing um, New York Times in seven days. So uh, what kind of uh, procedure that would need and what kind of experience people will um, witness and experience. Um, so also this newspaper is the most critical newspaper um, against the CCP. So you can see in this uh, photo that um, a person is holding the Apple Daily, um, a very early version. And the title on that is in Chinese is Wei Jingsheng, which is um, a very famous political prisoner in China was sentenced to prison um, again for 14 years. So this was the headline of Apple Daily in that time. So you can imagine that this is a very critical um, newspaper to talk about the human rights abuses and authoritarian policies um, in China um, by the CCP. And the person that holding this newspaper, of course, this is a younger version of him, uh, was Jamie Lai. So um, he was the founder of the of Apple Daily, and he is a very very successful businessman. Um, Apple Daily is just one of his business, and Apple Daily is not just a newspaper. It actually is a giant media company that um, include website, apps, video news, YouTube channel, like whatever you can imagine. So we usually call um, Jamie Lai as media tycoon um, in this sense. Um, beside a this successful businessman and media tycoon, he is also the biggest donor for the pro-democracy movement and pro-democracy parties in Hong Kong. Um, so you can imagine that he must be um, a very targeted figure for the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And Lai was actually arrested and charged for collusion with foreign forces, which means foreign governments and organizations um, in 2020 under the NSL. So Jamie Lai had been under custody for a um, couple of months now, um, actually like almost half a year, a little bit more than half a year now. Um, however, Apple Daily was continue operating until this major crackdown occurred. Um, so this crackdown start on June 17th, 2021. So just last week, um, not really last week, the week before last week on the Wednesday. Um, the things that are happened were include like five senior managers and editors were arrested for collusion with foreign forces. The same charge as Jamie Lai. However, on that day, it's unclear what exactly they did or Apple Daily did 
to um, involve in this kind of um, very serious accusation. The police only say over a hundred of articles have the concern of advocating for censors, uh, sanctions. However, um, which is forbidden by the uh, NSL. However, um, the police didn't uh, didn't specify what kind of article, which article, and what those articles said. Um, so, in a very unclear situation, um, five people were already arrested, and also the bank account for three companies, including Apple Daily, Apple Daily Printing, which is the company that print Apple Daily, and AD Internet, which is the company that run the Apple Daily website and video, like it's video news and other other uh, internet products. So the bank accounts of the three companies were all frozen. And more significantly, seven banks uh, received notification that they were banned from providing services to these um, three companies. So what consequence will come from that? Um, we will talk about it later on. Um, but the Apple Daily office was also raided and news materials were seized by the police, including over 40 computers by the journalists, uh, of the journalists. So all these procedures um, were authorized by this article, Article 43 in uh, the NSL. Um, so this article basically provide very um, expanded um, power for the police to do different kind of like searching, raid, um, seizing electoral device, um, civilian interceptions, um, frozen property, all kind of stuff. Um, and although like the language in the NSL is usually very broad, um, but just seven days, just six days after the NSL was enacted on July 1st, 20, um, 2020, just six days after that, um, the newly established Na National Security Committee issued uh, implementation rules of the Article 43, which detailedly provide all kind of authorities to the National Security Department of the Hong Kong Police, um, allowing them um, in the absence of court warrant to practice all these measures. So it involved very vague language, such as if the police consider that there are severe uh, concern about national security and the time or the uh, need to um, stay in secret uh, was not allowed, blah, blah. And then they can be examined for uh, um, applying for a court warrant. So the whole procedure of authorizing the police to do all these very extensive measures become an internal review process that allow the police to, without the court warrant, without any oversight by the court or other third party, to practice this uh, very uh, striking measures. So you can imagine that under all these measures, the Apple Daily is already in a very haphazard situation that its continued operation is very questionable. So the next day, um, two of the five senior managers and editors were formally charged with collusion, um, but or we still don't know what kind of article they were involved or how that was um, related to collusion. Um, however, the remaining staff of Apple Daily insist that they are going to continue publishing newspapers. Then the next day on June 19th, um, the two managers finally went on court uh, for a bail hearing. However, their bail were denied. So this is related to Article 42 of the NSL, which um, actually changed the landscape on bail decisions in the Hong Kong legal system. So before the NSL, um, in, the com in the Hong Kong law system, as in most of other common law system, there is this presumption of innocence. So usually the judges uh, and courts will rule in favor of bail. However, the NSL Article 42 provide a much more restrict um, uh, criteria for bail decision is says that 
um, unless the judge believed that there are sufficient ground to believe their defendant would not um, like have any behavior endangering the national security, otherwise the uh, the judge should not grant this bail. So um, it basically removed the uh, presumption of in favor of bail. Um, and re in reality, the, the judges consider all kinds of things. For example, your previous political expression, your financial status, your social network to suggest whether you have the capability of uh, in of jeopardizing national security. And in practice, most of the NSL defendants were denied bail. So these two managers, Joy, other national security defendants, uh, get their bail denied and right now under custody. And however, in this court hearing, we were benefited from it by knowing some of the evidence, the so-called quote-unquote evidence for collusion uh, presented by the, per the prosecution, including com column articles by outside writers advocating for uh, different policies by various foreign governments, um, and articles that by Apple Daily that encouraging um, readers to write letters to Donald Trump, the then American president, to pay attention to the Hong Kong situation and confront the CCP's aggression in Hong Kong. However, in all those articles, um, um, the articles that mentioned by the prosecutions, we can see no advocation for violence and no explicit um, advocacy for sanctions against the, the Chinese government or Hong Kong authorities. So there's not very specific behavior, we can say they seem to violate the NSL. However, in Article 29 of the NSL, there's this language that anyone who requests foreign governments um, to engage in other hostile um, activities against the Chinese government and Hong Kong authorities can be considered collusion with foreign uh, governments. So the most likely uh, scenario will be the uh, the prosecution and the court is considering this article as engaging in uh, like the especially the the prosecution the court we actually don't know because there's no confession and trial yet. However, the prosecution may be considering this article as engage uh, encouraging other governments to engaging in other hostile activities. Then. In this situation, it actually is a very extended um, interpretation of the NSL. And also in this particular case, it was used against um, political um, uh, expression and um, suppress freedom of speech. I think by any standard of um, like, uh, by the standard of a um, well-developed rule of law, um, like, law buying country is unlikely like this article could be considered as collusion. So this is what we learned on June 19th. Um, and on June 21 is uh, Monday, the Apple Daily Broad decide that um, the Apple Daily should end on the coming Saturday. Why the Apple Daily need to end? Because it's complete completely locked out from the Hong Kong financial system. Um, all the banks were not able to proceed any um, exchange by the Apple Daily Company. So they are not able to pay their hundreds of employees any salary or any you know, fees for um, the mis uh, the, the mission, um, this mission. So, and in particular, in the notice that sent to this bank, there is a lie saying that anyone who violating this um, this um, notification and help their Apple Daily to do any exchange could face seven years imprisonment. So it's a very high level threat to those banks and their employees. Um, so virtually lock Apple Daily out of the financial system and they have to end their company um, just in a week. However, this is Monday, um, they plan to end on Saturday, but just on Wednesday, something new happened. There's one more arrest against the chief writer of the Apple Daily. So the, the uh, Apple Daily board concerned that uh, if continue to operate, there will be more and more employee get arrest. So it decided to end the operation of Apple Daily at 
the midnight of the day uh, on Wednesday. So it's uh, uh, ending in advance. Um, so that day become the last day for Apple Daily, uh, a media, a newspaper that had been publishing for 26 years. Um, so you seeing this photo is the scene that this employee holding the last issue of the Apple Daily and the journalists and other citizens would come to in front of the building of uh, Apple Daily in support of the employees there. So the day Apple Daily issued 1 million copies and show out within a day uh, is truly a very popular newspaper in Hong Kong. So what do we learn from this um, very striking case like ending the most popular uh, newspaper in seven days? Why the authorities need to do this in such a hurried, uh, such a hurried manner? Um, so providing um, some background. So July 1st, 2021, so just two days from now will be the 100 years anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. And actually during this days, the Chinese government is um, practicing very substantial uh, censorship and civilian against the Chinese citizens. So although the Apple Daily is in Hong Kong and but considering the current political environment in Hong Kong, it's not totally surprising that the authorities will become intolerant for Apple Daily to publish during the 100 years anniversary of the CCP to criticizing the party and also gaining support uh, and read by a large amount of Hong Kong citizens. So um, to close down Apple Daily before July 1st, which is a very possible theory, um, uh, hypothesis, the Apple, the NSL actually serve as a political tool to practice this crackdown. Um, so in this sense, the NSL is already hard to be considered a normal, ordinary law, um, but it's more like a political tool against the major political oppositions of um, the party and of course, including the Hong Kong uh, authorities. Um, but the most concerning thing when we review this case, we can see that actually all this can happen to any companies, not just Apple Daily. So we mentioned all the legal basis, um, the Article 40, 43, Article 10, uh, 42, the implementation rules are all already there, authorizing tremendous power to the Hong Kong police to practice all the measures without any oversee and, uh, and court warrant or any um, conviction. So this actually can happen to any companies operating in Hong Kong. Um, the Apple Daily case actually we can see now is exerting a tremendous chilling effect, not only among Hong Kong medias, but also um, among business operating in Hong Kong. So this is the latest development in both the Jamie Lai case and uh, um, implementation of the NSL. And I'm now uh, off to Tom to talk about more specifically the Jamie Lai case, which is um, considerably the most um, uh, complex and uh, striking case in the implementation of the NSL. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. And I, I think that's given us a great outline of, you know, what are those very wide provisions in the law and how can they be interpreted and used um, in that sort of political sense. Um, now, if you've had a reaction to that, please do put your thoughts, reactions, questions in the Q&A. Um, we, we'd very much like to hear that so we can um, have that discussion at the end. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. And I, I want to say thanks to the the Melbourne uh, Asia Review and to the University of uh, Melbourne for this uh, invitation. And I also want to um, say thank you to my colleague, uh, Lydia, for those uh, comprehensive uh, remarks, sort of giving us an overview of the events of the past week. Um, as we were getting ready to, uh, to do this presentation today, we thought really we wanna start with the events of the past week because they really are so dramatic. Um, and tell us a lot about um, where things are going with the national security law, where things are going with the media freedom in, in Hong Kong, um, and uh, where things are going with uh, the reach uh, of uh, Beijing in Hong Kong. I think a lot of people would have thought that it would be 
unthinkable. If you go back to 2019, the idea that um, uh, Hong Kong's leading newspaper could be shut down in a matter of days, uh, that would be something that would be beyond uh, most people's conception of the realm of the possible. Um, and yet, uh, of course, here we are uh, still moving uh, deeper and deeper into uncharted political and legal uh, territory. Uh, it's my job uh, to, to sort of fill in some of the additional backstory uh, in terms of the case against uh, Jimmy Lai uh, himself uh, and uh, his prospects uh, as his case uh, starts to move to, to trial, um, uh, most likely in early uh, 2022. Um, but before I do that, I do want to mention uh, the briefing paper uh, that the Center for Asian Law has just uh, put out that uh, Lydia, myself, and our colleague Eric Lai uh, put out uh, just yesterday um, on uh, the national security law and the right to a fair trial. Uh, that paper is available uh, on our website. Um, I don't uh, know if, uh, um, uh, Lydia, if you're able to uh, put a link to the report in the chat. I should have done that uh, while you were speaking. Um, if you're able to do that, great. If not, I can do that during the, the sure, Q&A do because we're wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, that will give uh, some background and certainly touches on um, Jimmy Lai's case in particular, um, his access uh, or lack thereof to uh, bail uh, in the run-up to his uh, trial. So it will be relevant background to this uh, discussion as well. Okay, uh, Jimmy Lai. Uh, it's no secret that Jimmy Lai has been a sort of leading target of the national security law uh, from day one. Uh, one activist told us back in the fall of 2020 uh, that the aim or in one of the aims of uh, the national security law is to topple Jimmy Lai. And with the Apple Daily now closed and Jimmy Lai uh, behind bars waiting for his uh, NSL, uh, trial, it looks as though Beijing is uh, well on its way to achieving uh, that goal. I want to say a couple of things about um, the uh, basic facts of Jimmy Lai's uh, case, and then a word or two about some of the legal uh, elements. And then in conclusion, say a word or two about why I think the Jimmy Lai case is so important uh, and why uh, Beijing is sort of according it such a high uh, priority, why they take uh, Jimmy Lai uh, so seriously. And I, to sort of tease that a little bit, I think there are both political dynamics afoot and sort of deeply emotional uh, ones afoot uh, as well. Um, okay, with uh, uh, the uh, Jimmy Lai case, uh, we have uh, his initial arrest under the national security law taking place on August 10th, uh, 2020, roughly six weeks uh, after uh, the NSL went into effect. Uh, and the fact that he was uh, such an er early target obviously speaks to the high political priority um, that his case uh, was uh, both for the Hong Kong government and uh, for Beijing. Uh, if I have the numbers uh, right here, he was roughly speaking the 16th person arrested under the national security law. We're now at over 100. Uh, and the third person charged, and again, there the numbers I think are in the mid 50s to mid 60s. Um, so again, uh, very much at the top uh, of uh, the list, both in terms of arrestees and uh, in terms of individuals uh, charged. Uh, as Lydia mentioned, uh, uh, he was arrested for collusion with uh, foreign forces under Article 29. Uh, of the NSL, but he was released uh, after uh, that. Uh, he was rearrested on uh, December uh, 2nd and then formally charged uh, on December 12th. Uh, there was a back and forth in terms of his bail status. He was initially granted uh, bail by a lower court, um, but then his bail was uh, denied and he went back into jail on December 31st. Uh, a day that may be his last day of freedom uh, for quite some time. As probably many members of this audience know, uh, he was sentenced to 14 months uh, in jail back in April on a, uh, I guess we could say technically unrelated um, unlawful assembly charge having to do with a protest march uh, in mid uh, 2019. 
Um, and so questions of bail became at least slightly less relevant uh, in that context, but certainly are relevant to the larger question of uh, human rights and the rule of law in national security law uh, cases. Um, there does seem to be looking back on it, a certain degree of inevitability uh, to uh, lies arrest and to the charges laid against him. And I worry that that um, sort of seeming political inevitability, given that he has been a high profile uh, target for a long time can uh, conceal a little bit uh, the shocking nature of his arrest. Let us not forget that again, he is uh, the owner of the leading uh, uh, pro-democracy newspaper in, in Hong Kong and the number one selling newspaper in Hong Kong, regardless of uh, political affiliation. And any time that you have media vocals being arrested, you have a deeply troubling situation from the perspective of human rights, from the perspective of press freedom, from the perspective of uh, uh, freedom of speech. Um, and of course, we know that uh, Jimmy Lai's arrest and uh, his, uh, uh, the charges of uh, collusion also speaks to Jimmy Lai's role uh, as a, uh, you know, his personal role as an advocate for uh, human rights and democracy in Hong Kong. And as I'll talk about more in a moment, the charges obviously stemmed in part from uh, his various meetings with high profile foreign government officials, including um, then Secretary of State Mike uh, Pompeo um, here in, in Washington, DC, among other uh, US government uh, officials. So he's being targeted both uh, because he is uh, the owner of that outspoken media outlet and because he himself uh, is an outspoken uh, pro-democracy uh, advocate. Now, what do we know about uh, the case uh, against uh, Lai and how is it shaping out thus far? Actually, given how much time is passed and we're now in uh, June, we're sort of running up to July 1 and he was arrested uh, uh, on August 10th of last year. It's coming up on one year ago. Um, we know shockingly little uh, about the nature of the charges against him uh, and the uh, sort of full sort of nature of the government's case uh, that they plan uh, to present in court. And my own view is, having spoken to some uh, lawyers in Hong Kong who are following the case, is that this is part of the strategy. And we have seen this in other NSL cases that there are long delays in between initial charging, detention, um, denial of bail, uh, and the sort of effect anyway, uh, and I would uh, view it as almost certainly intentional, of having people sit in jail for months, uh, if not years at a time, uh, waiting for uh, trial. In other words, the government is already achieving a lot in terms of taking people out of circulation, even without having uh, achieved a guilty uh, verdict. I would also uh, argue that this kind of detention where people are left to wonder what did, uh, what did he or she do, uh, where the individual himself uh, or herself may wonder, what did I, I do? What is the nature of the case against me? That this reinforces the element of fear that has been a part of the national security law, uh, again, from, uh, from, from the get-go. Having said that, we do have a little bit uh, of background on uh, where we think uh, the government is going um, with uh, Jimmy Lai's case. And it does seem that uh, his international advocacy will be a part of uh, the case against him. Now, the problem there, of course, is that all of that advocacy, including the meeting with um, then Secretary of State Pompeo uh, took place before July 1. So there's a retroactivity problem if he's going to be charged under uh, the national uh, security law. Now it is true that uh, Jimmy Lai did do various sort of online meetings uh, with different international groups uh, between July 1 and his arrest on August uh, 10th, uh, 2020. Uh, but there's no indication that he made any statements uh, regarding sanctions against individual uh, Hong Kong or Chinese officials or other kinds of statements that could be construed as um, uh, collusion. Now, I hesitate to even run through this uh, information because it gets us into the realm of uh, 
trying to analyze Jimmy Lai, Lai's case from the perspective of uh, the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government itself. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Uh, it's not, if uh, the Hong Kong courts, as they are supposed to, are going to rigorously apply the human rights provisions of Hong Kong's mini constitution, its basic law, and if they are going to apply uh, the standards of international human rights law, it should not be a crime to advocate uh, for particular uh, positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, your own government to US government officials. It, it should not be a crime to talk about uh, the human rights situation in Hong Kong with uh, individuals in the, US, in the US State Department or uh, in Whitehall in the UK or uh, you know, in the European Union or what have you. Um, it simply is not the kind of activity uh, that should come to mind when one talks about national security law uh, offenses. Um, and yet here we are uh, trying to sort of tease out, well, did Jimmy Lai do that after July? Uh, one and if he did, what does that what does that mean? So I put that forward as a sort of means of helping us understand uh, what the government is doing vis-a-vis -vis Jimmy Lai. But just as quickly, I want to make clear that it doesn't seem to me that this should be the kind of uh, behavior that is prosecuted under a national uh, security law. I'll just add quickly: uh, it, it also seems clear that. Prosecutors want to tie uh, Jimmy Lai to another national security law uh, defendant uh, by the name of Andy uh, Lee, um, and through that to an organization st called Stand with Hong Kong uh, that has been very that was very involved in 2019 in international advocacy vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong's pro uh, democracy uh, movement. But there too, we don't know too much uh, about what Andy Lee, uh, this other activist, will say about his context with uh, Jimmy Lai and what is the nature uh, of the evidence that he has uh, to offer in Jimmy Lai's case. We only know that he seems to be a part of uh, the picture and a part of the case that the prosecution is seeking to build uh, against uh, Lai. I do think that Andy Lee's testimony is a potential uh, wild card. He was in detention uh, on the mainland after he attempted to flee uh, Hong Kong back in August of uh, 2020, and he may have come under ext extreme pressure uh, during that time, but we'll just have to wait and see wh what sort of testimony he puts forward uh, when the case goes uh, to trial. In conclusion, let me just offer a couple of quick thoughts uh, on why uh, Jimmy Lai has been such a high profile target um, and why uh, I think uh, the Hong Kong government and by uh, extension, uh, Beijing are taking his case uh, so uh, seriously. Now we can certainly have a long conversation about the prominent political uh, role of Jimmy Lai himself and of Apple Daily, and that certainly does uh, factor into uh, uh, Beijing's calculus vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jimmy Lai. But I, I do think, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that there's an emotional uh, component uh, here, that there's just something about Jimmy Lai that gets under Beijing's uh, skin, and that that is that sort of anger that they feel towards him is playing into uh, their effort to uh, prosecute him uh, under uh, the national uh, security law. I think there's something about his combination of wealth and outspokenness, uh, outspokenness and a simple refusal for years and years and years in the run up to 2019 and, and uh, continuing after that to, to bow to Beijing um, that really rankled uh, the Communist Party leadership. They're just not used to being defied uh, in this way year after year. And it really got to them, uh, again, to repeat myself. Uh, he got uh, under their skin. I also think there's a real symbolic uh, value here on both sides to the people of Hong Kong, as we've seen over the past week, and as Lydia described. Um, Apple Daily is such a symbol uh, of the pro-democratic aspirations of the Hong Kong uh, people and their belief in democracy and human rights and the rule of law. And Jimmy Lai obviously is the personification of uh, Apple Daily itself as its founder. Um, and so there, 
they are striking at uh, Jimmy Lai uh, himself and uh, I guess the paper as a means of striking out against uh, those ideas and those ideals. Um, so they are really trying to um, make a statement uh, and quite a dramatic one uh, with uh, the efforts to prosecute Jimmy Lai. I think there's more to be said uh, on this point in terms of the sort of the role that Jimmy Lai has played in Holocaust pro-democracy movement and the symbolic value uh, uh, of himself and his newspaper. But I do want us to have enough time for question and answer. So let me leave it there. And I look forward to, to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um, sobering. Um, and I think people do have a, a number of questions about how, how this is all playing out. Um, I might start with a question which I think is, is probably more for Lydia, which is around protests. Um, so you talked about that that week. Uh, one of our attendees says, um, I'm surprised that there wasn't any media coverage of protest as there were in, was in the last few years. Were there any large scale protests or any kind of response like we've seen in the past to this closure? I have that question too. I can say from the Australian media side, I think we saw pictures of everyone lining up to get their last copy of Apple Daily, but I didn't see pictures of protests. What was the situation, Lydia? Yeah, so um, to briefly answer that question, so I think the, la the larger scale gathering that happened during this uh, event is the, was the gathering that uh, in front of the gateway of the Apple Daily building, the one that you just saw in the photo that one person was holding Apple Daily and a lot of people were waiting um, in front of the gate. But if in the sense of like traditional Im image of demonstration, it actually did not happen. I think like the reason why it did not happen is largely because right now it's already one year into the NSL. Um, and like people already know that any type of um, like demonstration, especially those have not been authorized by uh, approved by the police, um, like people can not only like subject to charges of the NSL, but also like a lawful assembly and unauthorized assembly. And even those used to be minor um, offense right now could be sentenced in jail for maybe like uh, one to two or three years, um, like let alone any NSL charges. So if you get um, like charged by an NSL uh, offense, then basically Basically, before any formal trial, you could be expect to stay in jail for months, even over a year. So the chilling effect is very substantial that we have not been seeing very large scale uh, protests in Hong Kong for um, some time, um, not only because of the COVID-19 re restriction, but also because the chilling of effect of the NSL. That makes sense. And I mean, would it be fair to say this was sort of like a protest in that, you know, you can't have a protest, but you can line up and buy a coffee. But what was, do we know much about what the mood was? I mean, the pictures I saw made it look a bit more like a vigil or a funeral, like a very subdued sort of um, grieving sort of feeling. Is, is that what you've heard? Yeah, I think it's very obvious that, uh, that like there is a very uh, somber feeling among the Hong Kong people like I mean, like Apple Daily basically is the culture symbol of Hong Kong. So like just imagine like for New Yorkers, uh, like New York Times stater. So if New York Times was forced closure by the federal government within seven days, like what would, what would New Yorkers feel? So uh, like, like in those few days, my my social media thread is full of all kind of very sorrow expression about like Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore. Um, but of course, uh, you are very uh, right that when people line up to buy the 100 million copy Apple Daily, they are actually using the very sim uh, simple action to show their support. And a lot of people uh, suggest that actually um, the 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 death of Apple Daily is not a die, but uh, more like a 
the apple's seed is in everyone's heart that to remember oh. this feeling and fight on. Okay. Interesting. Well, and I might, if I can, follow up with another question on this um, or comment. Sorry, so they say it's a comment um, that you know Apple Daily uses um, written Cantonese rather than standard Chinese, and Cantonese is a key element in a separate Hong Kong identity. I mean, do you see that as part of what people uh, that somber feeling as well, that sense of a separate Hong Kong identity? Yeah, I think like the identity of Hong Kongers comes in, uh, consists of a lot of things, including the language. Uh, Apple Daily, a lot of their articles are written in colloquial uh, Cantonese, which is not very easy to be read, um, even by, you know, like, uh, mainlanders. So, um, uh, and beside Apple Daily, there's other thing happened in this month, which is the uh, June 4th, um, ceremony for yeah. their uh for memorizing their uh Tiananmen massacre so that was uh forbid from holding this year so the Hong Kong people also losing that and they have a, a major annual uh, demonstration every year um that is usually happen in July 1st and this year um the the police is not all is also not approving that demonstration so if like the if you are a Hong Konger, like in that moment, you will feel like you're losing everything you are familiar with. Uh, about the city, like its political presentation, uh, expression, and the dynamic, um, you know, just the, the level of freedom speech, freedom of speech, and what you can do, and what you can say, and what you would read, totally changed. So I would say there is a very strong feeling of uh, depression uh, going on in Hong Kong. Thank you. Well, uh, can I uh, give our next question to Thomas? Um, and this is looking specifically at the Jimmy Lai case. Um, can you say anything about access to legal representation for Jimmy Lai or others charged under the NSL? Are their lawyers under pressure to not take their cases? Sure. There have been some attacks on um, uh, some of the lawyers who have been involved uh, in his uh, case, and I'm thinking in particular of uh, Paul Harris, uh, who uh, is also uh, chair of the Hong Kong uh, Bar Association, and he has been personally attacked by pro Beijing. Uh, media outlets and the Bar Association itself has uh, been attacked, obviously somewhat separately from uh, Jimmy Lai's uh, case. Uh, so it's clear that they are trying to pressure uh, on uh, Jimmy Lai's uh, legal uh, counsel, uh, even as they are putting pressure on the judges who are handling uh, the case in order to sort of press them to, when the time comes, uh, deliver a legal verdict. Um, I, I want to make sure to, 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 to be clear that this is not a mainland China type situation where uh, lawyers are sort of not being allowed to uh, handle the case, not being allowed to sort of fully represent Jimmy Lai in court, but that pressure is there. Mm. Well, um, can I continue with you, Thomas? So um, many countries have some sort of national security law. Uh, could you speak to why Hong Kong's new national security law is so problematic, especially compared to laws of more democratic ju jurisdictions? Sure, sure. And I, and I think the, the questioner sort of hits the, the nail on the head there, which is to say, there are a lot of elements of this law that resonate with uh, the use of national security law or national security concepts um, in more authoritarian regimes like China, uh, and that really are not a part of, um, uh, again, the approach to national security law in places like the United States or Australia or, or what have you. Um, and I think it's the political use of uh, the law to target uh, key political opposition uh, uh, figures, key uh, democratic activists, people like Jimmy Lai in the media that uh, sort of sets the national security law apart uh, from uh, national security laws in, in other uh, countries, right? Uh, we actually had uh, a mini scandal uh, here in the United States over the past uh, couple of uh, months in which it was disclosed uh, that the Trump administration was trying to get phone records uh, for uh, certain Democratic members of Congress to see if they had uh, been involved in leaking uh, information to the, the news media regarding investigations of President Trump. And that 
caused uh, 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 something of a stir. Uh, politics is happening at hyperspeed in the United States these days, so it's hard for any one particular scandal uh, to get too much uh, uh, attention. But for me, it was a reminder of the kind of powers that uh, uh, the Hong Kong police have under the national security law that Lydia touched on. And it seems uh, that they are tapping the phones of opposition activists all the time. Uh, and we know that one particular pro-democratic politician uh, had her text messages used uh, against her uh, in a bail hearing uh, not too long ago. So we're seeing this kind of uh, national security uh, frame being used to target political opposition activists and that's uh, political opposition figures and that's very troubling. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose if I'm gonna speak from the Australian perspective, um, I've looked at Australia's foreign interference laws, um, and uh, I would say they are way too broadly drafted, you know, that sure. they define national security to mean um, Australia's political, military or economic relations with any other country. And if I um, provide information to a foreigner on that, I can, strictly speaking, be subject to a criminal offence. So I can see lots yeah. of situations where, you know, that, that same sort of idea of, you know, say colluding with foreign powers, that does exist in Australian legislation as well. And I would say it's yeah. widely drafted. Now, yeah. maybe one of the differences is that it might not be used as much here. I hope that is the case. I strongly and fervently hope that our systems yeah. of government are strong enough that, if, you know, I were to be arrested for speaking at a conference, which might, you know, strictly speaking, be a problem under that legislation, there would be an outcry. Um, but, but I think there's a general problem that when people draft national security laws, they make them too broad, you know, and that's me as the lawyer saying that, and I'm sure that, that um, many other lawyers would have that same, that same perspective. Um, okay, well, our next questions are getting us to focus on um, uh, focus on the role of universities. And so, Thomas and Lydia, I'll, I'll ask you to think about your university rather than Australian universities, because that's not a fair question. Sure. But I should probably give you a little bit of background. So in the news today, mm -hmm. uh, there's been media reporting of a report by Human Rights Watch um, mm -hmm. looking at intimidation of um, students studying in Australia. So they could be, say, mainland students students, Hong Kong students um, studying in Australia um, and looking at what universities can do about that problem. Um, there was also some reporting that individual academics feel this sense of intimidation and have been self-censoring. So that's, a, that's mm -hmm. a focus we have on at the moment. How much is that intimidation of students and their families back home affecting you know, their experience here in Australia? So, um, Maybe I might I might start with um, this question. So since the national security law covers the whole world, um, if not the whole universe, whoever publishes materials in print or online may be subject to charge or arrest by Hong Kong police, even if they're not within Hong Kong. Um, so how does this impact on research, speech and academic freedom at, for example, the University of Melbourne or at Georgetown, especially in the area of China research? So I'll start with you, Thomas, yeah. then maybe back to Lydia if you want to add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I will say a couple of points on that, and, and I have no doubt that Lydia will want to chime in as well. I mean, I think uh, as, as uh, academics, it is um, incumbent upon uh, us to be sort of speaking frankly uh, on uh, these uh, issues um, and uh, sort of giving uh, our, certainly our students and broader uh, audiences the benefit of whatever expertise we may we may have, um, and look, the, the national security law is a very real thing um, that is as broad as the question suggests, and that's very troubling. Um, but those of us who uh, have the privilege uh, to use a sort of term that's used a lot in the U.S. these days of being based at universities um, and have the, the time and the resources to try to wrap our heads around them, uh, I think have an obligation to be candid about what we are, we're seeing on the ground. I think it gets a lot more tricky uh, for our students, especially our students uh, from uh, mainland China. And I certainly did have students uh, come to me uh, in, in my classes at Georgetown and say that they're worried about speaking uh, candidly about some of these issues in a classroom 
classroom setting and what would other students say and, and whatnot. And there have been cases uh, uh, of uh, mainly Chinese students uh, saying things in the United States um, and then uh, sort of uh, catching flack for it when they go back uh, to uh, China. And, and I won't go into details of some of those cases, but they do illustrate that there's a real problem afoot here. And I think the best thing that, that we as academics can do there is to sort of say to folks, look, if you're feeling uncomfortable uh, speaking openly in class, um, you know, come see me and let's have a one on one uh, uh, session. Uh, let's uh, make sure that you are having an opportunity to think through and talk through these things um, in a way that um, is right for you. And, and I think that's the best that we can do in this troubling context. Yeah, understood. And, and maybe if I can just follow up with the second question on this, um, how much do you think reliance on revenue from um, Chinese students might result in self-censorship or avoidance of research in sensitive areas by, you know, management of universities? Is that something you've seen? I personally haven't seen it. One keeps sort of hearing about that. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, you know, uh, as a concern that that must be out there some somewhere. Uh, but uh, you know, I am certainly doing the work that I'm doing on Hong Kong's national uh, security law. Others at Georgetown yeah. are doing fantastic work. So, right. so far, so good, and and hopefully, full speed ahead. Well, over to you, Lydia. Your your response on that. Um. Yeah. So I think like. Um, as a like a chi um, China study scholar is um, very much uh, something will be in my uh, in my mind um, constantly because um, like there are different perspective of it. Like first, like as a uh, as a Chinese national, like you would think of like if you publish uh, research and say something outside the country and then when you go back to China or Hong Kong. Um, so like like they can like according to the NSL is definitely possible that they can persecute a person um, based on this kind of um, activities. Um, and also I think more is also an issue that for the people who study China, even maybe American citizens, American scholars or scholars all over the world, um, their academic career actually to some extent rely on they can go in and out of China freely. So they can do field work and also they can communicate with the Chinese people and even Chinese officials. So that is extremely essential for their career to maintain the possibility that they can go to China to do research. So um, the NSL in that sense will impose, will likely impose uh, self-censorship on them to how to talk about China and how to present China um, so that they can maintain the, uh, the freedom to go back to China to do research. So I would say actually the, um, this, the self-censoring effect uh, imposed by the NSL amount um, uh, experts studying China and um, like maybe even policy makers who um, need to research and make um, decisions about China. Um, like the effect is much more profound than, uh, than what we can explicitly vis um, witness um, at this point. Um, and also it could be a truly effect amount of uh, Hong Kong nationals, um, Hong Kong peoples overseas, like they will consider I want to go back to Hong Kong or I have families in Hong Kong. Um, and if like I say something or I um, are advocate for democracy for Hong Kong um, in the US or in Australia, uh, like that may affect the, the, the possibility that for them to go back to their hometown and they would force to face a life that is almost like exile, unexpected exile. Yeah. So it's, yeah. very, uh, grim, it's very grim about like this kind of effect on um, different people and um, like upon their like research funding or China the revenue that China's student bring, uh, my concern would be like um like like 
people can have different policy um, towards Chinese uh, students and other students. For example, like um, like like China st students can be seen as you know like protected in the sense don't say anything hurting the Chinese people's feeling. So the classrooms we involve Chinese students and classrooms without Chinese students actually will will. will present different academic or discussion standards and rules that could be actually also unfair for a lot of Chinese mm -hmm. students who come out of the country to learn about, uh, to learn information that were censored in China and when and want to enjoy uh, academic freedom outside China. Absolutely, yeah. And so the, you know, the, the chilling effect is, is definitely there. Um, but for what it's worth, there's been some good work done um, by Yun Jiang at um, Australian National University, looking at what practically universities can do about that. So having sort of online discussion, anonymous, um, being careful about group work and assignments, you know, things that you can do to try to create a more enabling environment for students to be able to contribute without intimidation. Um, but I, I think, you know, as has been noted by, by our questioners, um, given the extraterritorial effect, given the potential for intimidation, you know, this is a reality. And so universities then have to work out how they're going to deal with it. So we are now over time. I will ask if I can, um, with your Thomas, if you can answer the last question that has come up in the question bar, you can type your answer to that one. That would be great. Um, I'll just um, finish up by thanking our speakers. Um, we really appreciate your time and expertise. So thank you to Professor Thomas Kellogg and to Lydia Wong from the Georgetown University uh, Law School Centre for Asian Law. Um, if you've enjoyed this discussion, uh, the Asia Institute has a lot of other webinars um, and particularly the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies. It has one, I think, coming up, which I saw advertised this morning looking at um, birth policy in Xinjiang. So, you know, there are a lot of great topics that are covered. Um, you can find more about the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies and the Asia Institute online. You can follow us on social media and then you'll hear more about all of our excellent events coming up. So thank you again to our speakers, to Mark from the Centre for Contemporary Chinese Studies um, and to all of the participants for joining us in today's discussion. Thank you again.